Well, good morning. Good morning. Warm welcome to everybody here. We are at Capel Vron, a local Bible Centre Church. We meet here Sunday by Sunday in the Village Hall, the Naoth Gopher. And today it is our Harvest Thanksgiving. Uh, I searched it up on a, on a, uh, a search engine that you might use. Uh, and um, I found out that today was officially the last Sunday of harvest. So lots of people would have had their harvest festivals and Thanksgivings a bit earlier in the month. This is the, the last Sunday. So traditionally a time we thank God for his provision, food that's been gathered in. We remember that he is creator of the whole earth and he has good news for everyone through his son, uh, the Lord Jesus. So if you're here by an invitation, you don't normally come to church, you're, you're very, very welcome uh, to be here. There'll be songs, there'll be reading from the Bible, different people taking part. And there's a buffet lunch and tea and coffee afterwards. Uh, just uh, because there's a few people here afterwards, there'll be a few directions of where to sit and stand so we can get food out and stuff like that. Uh, but you're, you're very, very welcome to be here. We've also got a uh, crash and Sunday school during our time. Uh, so during the service, I'll, I'll uh, say the time to go for Sunday school. Sunday school is up in the um, top room and uh, Auntie Rian and Auntie Anne are the Sunday school teachers. But it's a, a harvest Thanksgiving. We're here to thank the living gods. I want to read you from Psalm 24 before I pray. Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And we're going to be thinking about that psalm from the Bible in our time this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you own the earth and the whole world. We thank you for the fullness of life that we see in the world around us. Creatures that multiply, birds and animals and fish. We thank you for the, the abundance of uh, humanity, uh, different races, different peoples all over the world. We thank you, Lord for the sheer variety of life, a beautiful world that shows your glory and your goodness. And this morning we pray as we come to you through Jesus that our hearts would be encouraged as we think of all your goodness. We pray that you would speak to us through your word, the Bible. We pray, Lord, that by your spirit, we would thank you, not just that you've made everything, but you are the God who can save us through Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his precious name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a great harvest hymn. I hope you know it well. You might have sung it at school. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land. And if you're able to, please stand and be ready to sing when you hear the music. As I said, a warm welcome to everybody here. Uh, you need to know uh, that today we meet uh, this morning at half past 10 and also this evening in the back room of the Naoth Gopher at five o'clock. We're an active church. We've got a, a lot on during the week. Uh, we have our uh, children's club on uh, Tuesday, Explorers here at half past three. And then on Wednesday, we have Bible studies uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon, and Wednesday evening. And then this Thursday, we have our toddler group in the back room of the Naoth Gopher at nine o'clock, but also at 11 o'clock, the ladies knit and natter. If you like knitting and you like nattering, uh, you don't even have to knit. You just have to come and natter. Uh, that's at 11 o'clock in the back room of the Naoth Gopher. And then services uh, morning and evening on the Lord's Day next Sunday. And our, our preacher will be uh, from South Wales, from uh, the lovely valley village of Mysakuma, Howell George will be coming and taking our services next Sunday. Hands up if you went on the Sunday school trip. Excellent. Yes, a few people did. It was a resounding uh, success uh, yesterday. We do have Sunday school during our time, which you're very welcome to come to. Right, we do have boys and girls here. Um, got some boys and girls at the back. 
Here's a song that we sang last week. Sorry, Rachel can't be here, so it's my singing now, and I'm going to do actions. Put your hands up like this. God made everything. So here's a song with actions. We've got some words on the screen if you'd like to follow through. Let's see. He made the stars to shine, twinkle, twinkle. So we do that bit first. He made the stars to shine, twinkle, twinkle. He made the rolling waves, whoosh, whoosh, like waves, whoosh, whoosh. He made the rolling waves, whoosh, whoosh. He made the mountains high, so high, and he made me. He made me. That's it. And this is why we love him. For me, he bled and died. The Lord of all creation became the crucified. So let's see if we can do that. He made the stars to shine, twinkle, twinkle. He made the roads, whoosh, whoosh. He made the mountains high. so high. And he made me ready to clap, ready to clap. And this is why I for me he blessed I, the Lord of all creation. Became the crucified. Pick a key, any key, it doesn't matter. Um, he also made the sun, okay? Uh, so we can put our hand out like this. We, we might not have the exact words for this, we'll see if we do. He also made the sun that shines on air. Pretty good. He made the rain and snow. And the things that grow, ready to clap, ready to clap. And this is why I think for me he died. The Lord of all creation became the crucified. Now, as a church, we want the boys and girls to take part and make sure they're listening. So we've got Auntie Helen. It's got a talk from the Bible, something interesting to think about now. So, Helen, if you'd like to come up. Right. Some of you may have met Henry before. Now, Henry loves stuff. He loves all the things he has. And I'm looking around and I can see some people who love stuff. Do you love your stuffed dragon? Yeah, you love your dragon. And we see teddy bear down the back there. Yes, he loves his stuff. He loves his toys, his books, his clothes, his game consoles and everything he has. And he keeps it in his bedroom so that his younger brother can't get at it. But he has so much stuff that he's only just got enough room to get into his bed in the night. Now, one day his mum tells him it's harvest and our church is going to be collecting things for refugees. So we're going to collect some bits that we don't use that might be useful for refugees. And we're going to buy some bits as well that we can give to them. Now, Henry, she says, I want you to go up to your bedroom, look for some toys you don't play with or some books you've read and let's put them in the box for the refugees. Oh dear, Henry does not want to do that. He likes his stuff. He doesn't want to give any of it away. No, his mum's a bit worried now. So later that day, she tells him a story from the Bible. And it's about Zacchaeus. Now, do you remember anything about the story about Zacchaeus? What do you remember? Anybody? What did he do? He climbed a tree. Hmm, what has climbing a tree got to do with harvest and giving away things? Hmm, now, Zach was a man like Henry who loved 
things. And as he began to earn money, so he began to acquire some things. But these things were his, and he'd earned them. Therefore, you know, he didn't think about anybody else or anything else in relationship to these. He liked to look at them and admire all the stuff he had and more. And he wanted more. And as he got more, he wanted even more. And like Henry, he ended up with a house full of stuff. And he liked looking at them. And he wanted more, so he cheated a bit. And he got money that he shouldn't have to buy more stuff. He didn't see that people, other people had less than him, and he didn't care. The more he got, the more he wanted. And the more he wanted, the less he was willing to share. But then Zacharias heard that Jesus was coming to town. And he decided he wanted to go and see Jesus, see this man. But he couldn't get to the front of the crowd. No one would help him. He had no friends who would help him get to the front. So he climbed that tree. And then things began to change. Firstly, Jesus spotted him and said, I'm coming to your house today, Zacharias, Zacchaeus. He came and Zacchaeus shared his food with Jesus. That was a first. And Zacchaeus sat with Jesus and he learned how much God cared for him and how much God had given him. And when he realized this, he knew that this was more important than stuff. Zacharias realized he had more stuff than he needed. He also learned that there was something far more important than stuff. And that was that Jesus was his friend. So, Zacharias, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus told everyone he was giving away half of his stuff and that he would repay anyone he had cheated. And at that point, Jesus turned and told everyone that salvation, life, freedom and healing had come to that house to Zacchaeus that day. Now, when Henry heard this story, he realized that his stuff had become more important to him than God and Jesus. So he thanked God and his parents for giving him all his stuff. Then he went and sorted out some toys and books for the refugees. He didn't earn, wasn't trying to earn it's his friendship with God and Jesus by giving away his things, he realized that God had given him all these things and giving them away was a good response to God's love. Now, sometimes our lives are full, so full of stuff or things, things we worry about, being popular at school, coming first in everything. And when we're thinking more about those things, we're not thankful for everything God has given us. We don't realize we need to turn to Jesus and ask him to be our friend. But if we do, we're able to see what we have, that what we have is from God. And we are able to enjoy all of God's world together with all God's people. Thank you very much. We're going to sing together.
just a song that really celebrates God's goodness to us. It's a song of praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. So uh, we're going to uh, stand and sing. We're going to take up our offering to the church. There's no pressure on any visitors to contribute to, the, to this. Also, we've been, uh, been collecting for the South Gwyneth Food Bank. That's run out of the church in, in Barmouth. That does a great work. Uh, the food bank, and it's more and more important, uh, particularly as uh, winter months are approaching. I just commend that work, the South Gwyneth Food Bank. If you haven't bought anything, all you have to do is type into a, a, a search engine that I won't mention, uh, and type South Gwyneth Food Bank. You'll find their website. You can give uh, financially, and you can also find out about the work that they do uh, through that, and I, I commend that to you. But we're going to sing this song as we give to the Lord's work. Mm. And Phil are going to uh, lead us in thanksgiving and prayer to God. Good morning, everyone. We thank God that Jesus himself is present, and we pray now. Lord Jesus, we know from Scripture that when you were here on earth, you fasted in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. You knew what it was like to be hungry. You knew what it was like to be tempted and tormented. But you suffered and you overcame. And we pray for those now who are less fortunate than a lot of us in financial situations. We pray that you keep them safe from temptation, from worry and stress. And we pray for ourselves that while we live in our daily routines, that we keep the Trussell Food Bank in the back of our mind and pick up items here and there so that all the drops of kindness and goodness will congeal into a beautiful pool of love and support for so many people. We thank you for the staff that run the food bank. Please provide people with generous hearts and time to give. Amen. Our gracious God, we worship you, our creator and sustainer of all things. Thank you that you are a good God whose care for the earth knows no bounds. We've been reminded that the earth is the Lord and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Forgive us that we have laid waste so much of your earth. You are the God of love and compassion, and we bring to you a world where conflict and famine is so widespread. Our hearts go out to the suffering people of Ukraine and pray that the vast reserves of food crops in that land may be distributed safely where the need is greatest. We think of the heartbreaking scenes in Somalia where thousands are dying daily through lack of food. Have mercy on the confused military situation in Tigray province. Lord, oh God, bring peace, lasting peace. We lovingly commend to you, Grace Village, uh, that they may continue to know your love and protection. We bring our own land to you in all its economic and political turmoil, 
many are now concerned about keeping warm and how they will feed themselves. Thank you for the work of food banks in recent years, reflecting the poverty and great need of our communities. Oh Lord, dear Lord, we remember the work of South Gwynedd Food Bank. And we pray that food may be distributed wisely and that no one will go without. You are the God who constantly gives. Thank you for giving us Jesus, your one and only Son. We're reminded that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And we recognize there is a hunger in the souls of people that is greater even than their bodily needs. Thank you for the promise of Jesus who declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. May we be conscious of your presence here as we worship you and as we receive your word. Thank you for harvest time when we can give our thanks to you. We pray that the Holy Spirit will so work in our lives that our heartfelt thanks will be a daily act to you, O oh God. Accept our praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, boys and girls have sat so well. We're going to sing one more song before it's time for crash and Sunday school. We're going to sing a, another kind of contemporary hymn, which talks about how creation sings the song of the Father, gives thanks uh, for God's creation, and set, proclaims that God is creation's king. And it also talks of the hope that those who trust in Jesus have for creation. So we're going to stand when you hear the music and we'll sing this together. Well, um, I'm going to read now from the Bible. Everything we do and say as a church, we want it based on the Bible. We believe that the Bible is God's word to humanity. He speaks as the Bible is understood and explained and proclaimed. I'm going to read you uh, the psalm that we had just a, a, a snippet of at the beginning. If you have one of the red books at the back, if you want to follow, this is on page 555, Psalm 24. We read that it's a, a psalm of David, the Old Testament, uh, Israel's most famous king, David. This is a psalm that he wrote. Let me read it to you. The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, his saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? 
the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. I want to speak to you about certainty in a broken world. And I want to speak to you from this psalm, long, long way back in Old Testament times. This psalm was probably used when the Israelites returned from a victory in battle to Jerusalem. They would sing this psalm. It was sung by the Jews every Sunday. And I don't know if you noticed, it's got this element of certainty. The earth is the Lord's. He will receive salvation. The Lord is the King of glory. Certainty, strength. It's a song. It's to be sung. I don't know about you. I went to a Church of England school. We are made to sing hymns in assembly. I've got to be honest, we didn't sing them with much certainty, but we mumbled them and uh, even protested by not singing them if we could. And it was all mumbo jumbo. It was all strange religion and ideas. I thought that Christianity was about uncertainty, weird ideas and rituals, things that you didn't really understand, mumbling. When you look at the Bible, actually, it's about certainty, hope. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, of being certain of what we cannot see. Jesus, through this psalm, calls us to great certainty. I want you to think, as we look at the certainties of this psalm, what your life would be like if these certainties were front and center in the driving seat. Now, um, looking at the TV listings for this week, our monarch, King Charles, is appearing on BBC One's Repair Shop. I only got into this in the last year, and I know a few people here probably like the Repair Shop. The idea, there's this barn, and there's this guy, Jay, and different people bring uh, their beloved items, family heirlooms, things that have got broken, and there's all these experts, and they can piece it together, and it's very warm, and it's very nice. Round our, our kitchen table, when I said this, we were discussing, well, what would a king have that he would want to repair? What would it have a king have that would be broken? And now I know they filmed it when he was Prince Charles, but it's, it's still, still a question because surely um, they would have nothing that he couldn't fix himself. He's got all these people, and we were talking about this, and somebody at our, our dinner table uh, piped up with, well, maybe he'll come to them. He'll say, what needs fixing, King Charles? And he might say, um, I've got this country. <laughs> I've got this kingdom. And, and that's funny if it's not profoundly true. I was just reflecting on this week. We live in a world that is profoundly broken. And we live at a time of great uncertainty where we see so much brokenness. There's a brokenness economically and in society. People facing an uncertain winter. People not being able to eat, to heat their houses. There's polit political brokenness. I don't need to go into details about that. There, there's an uncertainty. People looking on. But most of the point, there's a, a social brokenness. There was a report on child abuse this week. Shocking, those kind of findings. There's Molly Russell and her parents campaigning about the influence of the internet on young people. That seems to be out of control. There is a divisiveness in, in discourse with people each other, people shouting at each other. You've got um, the football scene, done so much to combat racism, except it's still there. There's a, a brokenness about the world. And I know that has always been there. 
And as year on year goes, for all the good things we see, and we do see good things in the world around us, and we do see selfless people helping each other and people going right, but there's always this brokenness in the world around us. A conflict, a war in Europe, suffering across the world, instability. The Isley Brothers, Isley Brothers, sang the song, when will there be a harvest for the world? It's a good question. When is there going to be blessing? When is everything going to come right? And this is why I find the Bible and the message of Christianity so compelling. I was somebody who kind of drifted, maybe at university, away from my Christian upbringing and Christianity is not just for people who are raised in it, it's for everybody. But what brought me back was that the Bible explains the brokenness. What I see in here of the reality of man's sin and rebellion against God, a world that's divided and under God's judgments, I see in the world around me. And I see in myself, the Bible explains this profound brokenness that is in us and is out there. But more than that, it gives us certainty about the God who can fix it. You see, this is what I want to say to you. In Jesus Christ, God has entered a broken world. And he has done all that is necessary to repair it and fix it. And he will, he will sort out all that is wrong. This is the hope of the gospel that Christians proclaim certainty. A friend of mine told me about a friend of his who was fishing on the, the banks of the glass limb. And he'd gone to test the, the strength of the bank. And the bank collapsed away from him. And this man fell in head first into the glass lane and he was on his own. Imagine that. There you are. You're in the middle of water. You're scrabbling around. You're looking for something to hold on to. Maybe you clasp at a few kind of bits of clumps of grass, but they come off in your hands. You, you grasp some reeds, but your hands uh, uh, go through them. Uh, you want to grasp some roots, something firm. So you've got purchase. You can lift your weight. I think this is so profoundly true of Christian faith that a lot of the things in this world that we look to, we clasp at, is clutching at straws. They don't give hope. Christianity really gives certainties that you can hold on to in a broken world. Three certainties from this psalm that we're given. Three certainties that you can have. So first of all, verses one and two, we have the certainty that God founded the world. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, everything in the world, every flower, every atom, every fish, every man, every woman, every bin man, every politician belongs to God because he is the maker and the owner of the whole world. Not a, an idol, not a figment of our imagination, the living God, Father, Son and Spirit. There's a label, like on the label on the back of my children's uh, uh, school clothes, uh, that says of everybody, an invisible label that says, mine, God made you and he owns you. And this world that we live in is founded, it's established. God is a reliable builder that makes a house with sure foundations. The house might get trashed, but it will never be destroyed. There might be brokenness in this world due to man's rebellion, but the world will never be destroyed because God founded it. He founded it, verse 2, upon the seas and established it upon the waters. In the first chapter of the Bible, God makes everything out of nothing. He creates heaven and earth. And in the process of creation, the, the waters are swirling around and God speaks, and the waters are gathered into one place, and dry land appears. Like a, a man talking to his unruly dog. Stop! Get into place! And the seas and the waters flow. 
There are boundaries to this creation. There's a a boundary between uh, the swirling waters of chaos and earth. God founds a fixed, moral, stable world. That's really important. That's a a stable thing. Let me just say, this world is not going to end because some tyrant decides to fire a nuclear missile. That may happen. The world might be devastated. But that is not going to snuff us out. We live in a stable, certain world made by God. And it will end when he says. We've already seen this at the flood in the book of Genesis. You know the story. If you know any stories of the Bible, you might know the story of Noah. How God judged humanity's rebellion and sin and and, and sent a a flood uh, blotting out life apart from Noah and his family who trusted the Lord and were saved. After the flood, God promises, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer, winter, night and day will never cease. Genesis 9, 22. He has established it upon the seas. There are boundaries. This is why we celebrate at harvest. There is a fixedness to the world. Just imagine what it might mean to you if you lay hold of that in your life. That there is a God who is stable and secure. He's able to sort out the swirling chaos with a word. That means he can subdue the chaos in your heart. He can subdue the chaos around you. You can lie your head on your pillow knowing that God is. So this is not some crutch. Faith is not a crutch to get you through things. This is a profound reality. The living God. We offer you the certainty of knowing God created everything. Secondly, from this psalm, the certainty that you can stand before God. It's an Old Testament psalm. And they start singing verses three to six about the kind of person who can approach this God and stand with him. What is God's kind of person like? Well, what is God like? Well, it says, verse three, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? What is God like? He is fundamentally perfect. There is nothing wrong. There's no shadow. There's no no injustice. There's no blind eye to stuff in God. There's no nudge, nudge, wink, wink. It's all right. He is fundamentally holy, perfect, all the way up, all the way down. This is what God is like. So who is the kind of person who can have a relationship with this God, who can walk towards this God. Well, the psalm says, what is God's kind of person? It's the kind of person maybe sometimes we'd all like to be like, a person of integrity, somebody with clean hands and a pure heart, somebody who doesn't backstab, somebody who's not dirty with their tactics, somebody who's sincere, somebody who doesn't lift up their soul to what is false, somebody who speaks what is True. This is the kind of person who will be blessed by God. This is the kind of person who will receive vindication from God. There's a problem. Because if that's the certainty of standing before God, that kind of person, the problem is I haven't been like that. And I'm pretty sure you haven't been like that. The problem with the world, while it's so messy like it is, is that We have rebelled against the gods who made us and loves us. So if that's the kind of person who can stand before God, I've got a problem. The gates of heaven for me, as I am, are slammed shut. 1966, I'm English, so I can uh, uh, say this. We won the World Cup. Bobby Robson talks about, at the end of the football match, the captain of the English team, He had to walk up the stands to receive the trophy from the queen and shake her hands. Except as he was going up the stands, he realized he played full 90 minutes of football and his hands were caked in mud 
and he was fixed upon the white royal glove, perfectly white. And apparently in the footage, you can see him trying to desperately clean his hand up. Uh, the problem is his shirt is dirty as well. H how can somebody smeared with dirt shake the clean, pure, royal hands? How can you and I, even the best of us, have got things we're not proud of, ashamed of? How can we stand before the God who made us and loved us, who's holy? But the amazing thing of this psalm, those verses aren't so much describing you and me as they're describing a king of God's people, God's king. What was God's king, David? What was the ideal? What is he to be like? He was to be like that, an inside out, person of integrity, clean hands and a pure heart. God's ultimate king, Jesus, born in a stable of all the people in the world. Jesus was someone with clean hands and a pure heart. If you read the Gospels, that's what's so breathtaking about Jesus, his integrity. He says to people, forgive your enemies. And on the cross, he forgives his enemies. He's pure. He doesn't uh, lift his soul up to what's false. He suffers. He cares. This is who can stand before God. Jesus died on the cross for your sin and my sin. He takes the mud and the dirt that's all over me upon himself on the cross. He is punished for it, and yet he received blessing and vindication from God, his Savior. He's raised up to God's right hand. I am not getting into heaven on my own tickets. I'm getting into heaven on Jesus's tickets. I am getting into heaven because God sees me in Christ, because I've trusted in him. So although as a Christian, I'm, I'm born again, I want to be a person of uh, integrity, clean hands and a pure heart, ultimately is Jesus who brings me in. A Christian is someone who has the certainty of standing before God. Imagine that, a root to hold on to in the swirling chaos of life. God made everything. God accepts those who trust in Christ. And that's open for anybody here who will come. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, God can accept us because of Jesus if you come to him. So the certainty that God made everything, the certainty you can stand before God, and the certainty that God will triumph. So here comes the ark back into Jerusalem from a victory over enemies. And they say to the, the gates, lift up your gates, your ancient doors. And they proclaim, here comes the conquering one, the king of glory. In order for the earth to be established, the swirling waters of chaos had to be put in their place. In order for Israel to triumph, enemies needed to be defeated. In order for a broken world to be fixed, enemies of death and judgment and sin and hell need to be subdued. And the psalm proclaims, God has done it. I better share a Welsh football illustration. A few years ago, Wales won the, the Euros. Uh, they got so far. I watched on the telly of the Welsh team coming back uh, to Cardiff and going around Cardiff in a bus. And there are a couple of lifelong Welsh football fans who are weeping with joy, just weeping with joy. We cannot believe it. The boys did it. What a great victory. What a great victory. You can only imagine what would happen if they actually won it. It'd be incredible. Uh, but the thing is, the cross where Jesus died doesn't say failure. Jesus doesn't die. Oh, there we go. He was a good man. He taught us how to live. Let's buck up, try a bit hard, help the poor, that kind of thing. Wait around. We don't have much certainty. Jesus didn't die as a failure. Jesus said, finished, finished when he died. Three days later, the tomb was empty. Jesus walked out of the grave. More than that, after talking to his disciples for 40 days, they saw him be lifted up 
and taken into heaven. Can you be, imagine, imagine that you're a, a believer of the Old Testament and you're in heaven, maybe you're an angel, and there you are. Maybe it's a huge hall like this. It's thousands and thousands of people. And Jesus Christ walks in after dying on the cross. He comes into heaven. Open up your gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Jesus Christ on the cross, triumph. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. He will come to sort out all that is wrong with a broken world. But whoever comes to him now has sin forgiven. They participate in his victory. God will triumph. Because Christ has won and he is Lord. He is Lord. So Christianity is not about clasping straws. Christianity is laying hold of certainty. So I can say to everybody in this room, come to Christ. That might involve for you a lot of head scratching and thinking thinking, can I trust it? Who is Jesus? What does it mean for me? You may think some reflection. I'm happy to talk about that. At the end of the day, we need to take the certainty that God offers us through Jesus. Because the king, the real king, has something broken, but he doesn't take it to the repair shop. The message of the gospel is God fixes it himself. God made it. We ruined it. Jesus fixes it. It's the summary of the Bible, which means if you come to him, he can fix you, forgive you, and you can trust him. What would you be like if those kind of certainties were front and center of your life? We're going to sing now of the hope that we have, just the call for all people to come and worship the living God. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice we're gonna therefore since we have been justified through faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of god that's the confidence that a christian has in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Please don't shoot off if you don't.